Yo, how's it going, folks? Welcome to episode 156 of the Simple Life Podcast. Hope you're keeping well. Hope you're enjoying these dire last weeks of summer. We're actually having an Indian summer, or at least we are in the north. It's been bloody lovely this week. Uh, I might, you can, I've even got a tan, a slight tan. So, yeah, I'm happy this week, very happy. Um, this is being recorded on a Friday, being released on a Monday. This weekend, we have the uh, DCC end of summer session. Um, I'm assuming it's going to go well. Looking at the weather, it's pretty damn good. Uh, talking with the police, they're leaving us alone. Talking with the local residents, they're quite happy to attend. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're building quite a, a little following and gathering um, and grouping of people back together again, which is brilliant to see ahead of the, obviously, rebranding of DCCC into the winter. Um yeah, I've got some housekeeping, but we'll kind of cover that at the end. I want to jump uh, straight into today's guest, who is a consultant neurologist, prescription cannabis specialist, public speaker and author. They are the honorary president of the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society, director at Maple Tree Consultants and honorary president of the Cannabis Industry Council. They are Professor Mike Barnes. How are you doing, brother? Hi, Sumpa. Yep, I'm good. And thank you for asking me back again. I think this is the third time we've had one of these chats, isn't it? Something of that order. So yeah, so. pleasure to pleasure to chat again. Always, always. Uh, so yeah, obviously we're gonna I think stick quite within the remit here of sort of prescription cannabis and conversations yeah. about what's happened sort of since tw- twenty eighteen. Uh, as we were just talking about in the prelude, it is going to be a similar kind of carbon copy of two thousand and twenty two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, these conversations need to be had. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's always good to, you know, bridge the divide between our worlds. Not that either of us like to think that there is a, you know, two separate worlds that we live in, but through legislation and language and nuance, we're, we're kind of, yeah, yeah. and polar yeah. opposites. Um, so yeah, I guess, what's new since February 2022? Well, that's a good question. As we said before, we came on air, as it were. Um, I'd like to say that this has happened and that has happened and that has happened, but uh, there's not been that much um, exciting progress, put it that way. We, we've got progress. Let's look at the numbers. Of probably two years ago when we last talked, I, I can't remember, but probably about 20,000 people have been prescribed, maybe of that order. Now I reckon it's pushing towards 50,000, 45 to 50,000. So you can say that's great progress. And in one sense it is, it's, you know, 45,000 people got a prescription for cannabis, hopefully that's helping them in whatever ailment they have. Um, but as we've said, you know, if we accept the figure that's banded about of 1.8 million people using cannabis medically, not, not recreationally, or there's an overlap, um, you know, we've barely scratched the surface still. Big choices now, uh, 42 online clinics, all wow. online. Um, I don't know how some of them make any money because there's, uh, you know, the, the, the demand is sadly not going up that much. But nevertheless, it gives people a choice uh, of clinics. There's about 150 prescribers now, and as you know, they're not uh, they're not all uh, medics. The pharmacists and nurses are now coming uh, into the forefront, which is good, I think. Um, so that's progress as well. Choice of product, you probably know more than I do, but there's now um, 200 plus products in the UK, big range, um, probably pushing 75%, even 80% flour and 20%, 25% give or take oil. So what we haven't done is give people other formats, which may suit some. You know, like tablets, like sprays, capsules, creams, particularly creams, I think, are good for skin conditions and arthritic conditions, suppositories even for people with you know, pelvic cancer. So all those other formats that are around a little bit in the CBD market, uh, and of course abroad, Canada and the US, a wide range of different formats, and we haven't got that yet. There's some coming. I think that's a pity that it's all flower oil dominated still, and there are some people who are more comfortable with those other formats and will benefit from other formats. So that's something that hasn't progressed very much. Quality, what can you say? I think quality is on average, probably better than it was when we last talked two years ago. I mean, we all know there's some good quality products on the prescription market and there's some not good quality products in the prescription market. I think probably over on average, the quality has improved. I know you can differ with that, Simper, but I, I think I would agree. Um, cost is sort of holding its own. 
average cost of um, the average cost of flour these days for prescription is about seven pound to seven pound fifty average. It varies a lot. And depends where you live in the country, that's broadly compatible with um, street price. Again, it depends a lot where you live. So the, the costs are sort of holding their own, uh, which, is, which, is, which is good. Um, so overall, the quick summary of that ramble, um, yeah, there's been some progress, not as much as any of us would have liked. And I think the big thing that I, I want to see is this is available free. And let me avoid all those discussions on price and cost, as it should be uh, on the National Health Service. And, you know, when the government voted to change the law and back uh, nearly six years ago, for heaven's sake, I, I don't think it was in the, in the idea that you could only, only get it if you paid for it. So, And that's mm. the sad state. We've still got, it's got five... Uh, NHS prescriptions at this point in time, there may be a sixth one on the horizon, but I mean, wow, you know, mm. six in six years isn't isn't a lot uh, to say the least. So that's the big thing that bugs me and we want to do something about is get this on the NHS, then I can finally retire. Mm, nice. Well, I look forward to a good retirement. Uh, yeah. I would like to be optimistic and say that those two timescales are compatible. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> It's a close but, run thing, something. Yeah, so yeah, boy, enjoy some semi-retirement, which I'm guessing yeah, okay. you are as, as honorary president rather than chairman. So yeah, uh, I don't have to do anything. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, yeah, it's let's kind of work backwards from this. Then, yeah, I agree. I think the the NHS thing is problematic. I think a big yeah. part of it is a hangover from this introduction of the consultancy class. No offense to yourself as a consultant, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Th this then being brought into the NHS and this constant, oh, reform, top-down reforms and spending God knows how much money to bring in people to come and look at the whole thing, go, oh, let's tweak this, tweak that. And yeah. I think the legacy of that has meant that, oh, well, there's no one in the NHS that knows cannabis. We've been saying for like half a century, it's terrible. So we have to outsource this. And I think the... Yeah financial incentive whether it is intentional or not it becomes all well, free good for, really good for the patient but whoa, 13 quid a gram that's really good for us um you know what i mean so it's i think the yeah, it's that tension uh, yeah just right. that that frustration i think yeah it kind of comes to something the care quality commission said recently uh they described the uk's medical market as a pseudo recreational uh market which i thought was quite quite interesting um, and I think the reasoning for it seems to be the choice, the way you have a choice, like you said, of these 200 plus products, um, in the UK is not the same as you do with prescription medications. Normally you've got your doctor, you yeah. know, nothing about this. We're not America or New Zealand where the advert comes on and goes, ask your doctor today if cannabis is good for you. You know, we don't, we don't have that kind of leading yeah. thing. It's, it's, you yeah. go to the professional, you defer to their expertise, but in this instance, I think with that lack of education, most people got their doctors and the doctor begrudgingly or the receptionist begrudgingly gives them their summary of care, knowing that, oh, you're just using this to get drugs because the yeah. education isn't yeah. there in the NHS. It's no, you're right. duplicitous. I mean, I'm still bumping heads with people in psychology that are like, well, you can't use cannabis. And I'm like, I'm prescribed cannabis. And I'm like, oh, well, we, we think you're gaming the system. And it's like, you do know what? This is the easiest thing in the world to grow and probably apart from cocaine, the easiest drug to access in the UK right now. Yeah. So it's yeah. I think there needs to be that that alignment and that uh parlay between stakeholders and, and policymakers and until there's a financial incentive, I don't see that. And that's where I think I brought this up last time we spoke. My yeah. dream is let's make the NHS grow weed. So then it's it's not loss leading. Ha have a recreational market and get the NHS quality weed sold at that price and subsidize all of the yeah. healthcare. Yeah, and what they haven't realised, and there's now a couple of, since we last spoke, there is a, mainly a paper on pain that actually showed, not surprisingly, that uh, introducing cannabis for pain was cost effective. It would pass the nice, I, I don't like nice much, but the nice standards of cost effectiveness, it was better. It was as, I'll rephrase that, it was as good as a painkiller as most of the other things on the market, not especially better on average, but the side effect profile is hugely better. Mm -hmm. And you can save money because some of those um, analgesic drugs um, are just damned expensive. So if you can save money, it's as good as and less side effects. What on earth is stopping people from, from doing it?
it is mm -hmm. a lot i think is as you said it's down to education it's down to ignorance it's down to hangover stigma etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah i think that the pain one is an interesting one because i discussed this with my friend the other day he hurt his back and I went into my uh, apothecary cupboard and I went, all right, what have we got in my formulations of various oils, caps, lotions, and potions? And pulled him some bits down. And about 45 minutes later, he went, yeah. the pain isn't gone, but it's just, I'm aware of it. I can look at it and go, oh, I'm in pain. And I remember, so when I go to stand up, I'm aware to not hurt my back anymore. When I let it bend down, I'm aware to not hurt my back. Whereas opioids, especially, that just turn off that, that nervous system response, you can end up harming yourself. And then as you've come down from yeah. the, the analgesic effect of the drug, realize you've harmed yourself further. So I think the the awareness for cannabis for pain in that way as well as it is a massively important and under uh, underappreciated sort of aspect of the uh, the interaction of the drug, you know? I think you're right. And I think that's the problem with the... If you do cannabis in a sort of standard pharmaceutical type trial with a placebo for ignoring the difficulties of actually doing placebo, all that stuff... Um, and you, the traditional thing to do is ask people on a scale of naught to ten how bad's your pain. You know, naught, no pain, ten, no severe pain. You can imagine, and it's, does it go down in a statistical way? But I think that, and there are studies that confirm that with cannabis. But there are studies that don't confirm that with cannabis. I think people miss the point that you just made very well. Is that if you do, how bad is your pain? Well, it's still there. It's still seven, but actually, I don't care so much about it. Mm. It's um. And that's a that's a subtle difference. That people, yeah, I'm not so bothered as I was a bit. It doesn't intrude on my life as much. And that's that is really important. And any uh, studies done have got to take that into account rather than just the let's mark this on a naught to ten scale. But I think you're right. Yeah, interesting. I think like I said, quality of life. Um, and I think that we see that with the way the receptors respond to sort of the stacking of, of opioids. Yeah. That you can then end up obviously more and more and building that tolerance and then the continued effect and impact of that like you said of those side effects um then become detrimental a lot of people come become exactly. constipated so then you need to take these other exactly. drugs and that affects your dietary and your microbiome and da 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 da, da. and yeah i and think it's things are real i mean constipation people say oh well constipation say so what but that is a real problem dry mouth mm -hmm. yeah is a real problem with some of these drugs it's yeah so side effects that sound superficially to be not so bothersome are actually a real problem in quality of life terms so mm. yeah that, that's important to, to side effect i don't think people take into account enough the better side effect profile of cannabis uh, compared mm. to um, a lot of the prescription medications particularly in epi particularly in epilepsy with children some of the anticonvulsants that are used are really horrible in terms of their side effect profile and, you know, you're almost better off having seizures than having the side effects of the, of the medicine. Uh, and cannabis doesn't have that effect at all. It's it's so much better. Yeah. So are we any closer to this thing of cannabis being sort of a first line, first response? Because, I mean, I, what you were saying there drew me instantly back to, I'm sorry if I'm naming the wrong person here, but I think it was a conversation with Lisa Quarrell. And she was telling us how the doctors wanted to drill, I think it was 22 holes into a child's brain. Um, but the, that was their consideration before they would consider cannabis. I mean, this was a good four years ago, three years ago now. Um, but I was just wondering, are we, because obviously there is that stigma in these different, it's the separation of it. The clinics are happy, the private spaces, and they all got access to, theoretically to the same data, but then the legacy institutions of like the epilepsy associations of like MS, except we MS is a bad one, but you know, of, of conditions that then have these groups that are, more inclined to go to the traditional medicine, uh, the traditional uh, drugs for that illness, rather than look at you know this new thing of cannabis. Yeah, no, that that's that's right. There's still, and I understand it. There's still this thing that you've got to go to a licensed medicine first, mm -hmm. uh, unlicensed medicines, or uh, second or third, whatever. And cannabis, of course, except epidemics and side effects, which. Uh, it is unlicensed. So I think that is a real issue. It's a real issue for the funders. It's a real issue for NICE. It's a real issue for many doctors. And what can we do about that? Well, I don't think, personally, you can put cannabis through a sort of pharmaceutical approval route. It's not a pharmaceutical. It's a botanical. Let's be obvious. It's blooming obvious. Mm -hmm. So what we need is a route to approve it as a licensed medicine, as a botanical. And actually, I mean, I'm not a great expert in the intricacies of 
the EU legislation, but even in the EU, bless it, there is a route to approve a medicine if it's a botanical, so a botanical approval. And we haven't, unless we've adopted the EU thing, we haven't got that in this country. What I've been long saying is we need uh, a botanical nice. We need to approve it as a medicine, uh, as a botanical. And if you look at the so-called real world medicine, again, take epilepsy, um, if you look at it as a purely pharmaceutical, there's not many double-blind placebo-controlled classic studies that show it's an anticonvulsant over other things against mm. placebo. There's not many. There are some, but not many. Mm. If you look at the real-world evidence, it's overwhelming. We've just done, Maple Tree's just done a, a booklet on cannabis and epilepsy evidence. There's 90 papers published, over 8,500 people, mainly children, that have gone through these studies. They're pretty well similar in terms of their outcomes, great outcomes, but if you put that to a, a pharmaceutical body like NICE, I say, well, there's not much evidence there because they dismiss, they dismiss all that other stuff. NICE even, bless it, dismissed every, any evidence that's not in English. So, of course, our colleagues in Germany and Spain and Italy are, of course, complete idiots and um, uh, they're, they're not really worth looking at. So that I'm prattling again, but I mean, the main thing I think, come back to the original question, is that we need to take into account real world evidence some governmental body needs to look at that evidence and say, yes, it's a, it's safe, it's proper, it works, taking out this evidence, we'll license it as a botanical. And then doctors and the funding bodies and everything should be much happier that, oh, we're dealing with a licensed medicine all of a sudden. Mm. That's not a big, it's not a big deal in terms of doing it, but it is a big deal in getting government bodies to accept it. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I saw something the other day uh, set so the formation of the UK's first psychedelic trade body, and it got me. It got yeah, got me thinking. Again, the whole thing of trade when the drugs not lawful, and you know, it's still technically in the law, like life in prison for production of LSD. Like it's not in practice, but in paper, it's still written that way. You know, it's the the drug laws are, are, are mental when it comes to some of these these novel compounds. Yet the international trade is moving so fast, and it there's a convergence of interest and the, the anti-capitalist in me is cringing right now, but I can see benefit for both parts, for all parties. If they almost create, like you said, a, a secondary licensing route under the home office yeah. through the traditional uh, health regulatory associative bodies, yeah. but that is separate. So it is in its drugs in their raw state. And I think that then gives us a way to study through research and license through access these profound experiences that these drugs can give you know ketamine infusions are lawful in the uk if you've got six grand and you go down for a weekend but if yeah. you you sneak a gram of ketamine into a festival whoo you know what i mean it's i i think there's a way to bring those things together to have that sensible yeah. because it's all about responsibility uh and i suppose insurance i guess in a way like who is ultimately responsible for the actions of individuals i'd like it to be well i'm over 18 i'm an adult it should be assumed what yeah. i consent to i'm allowed to do um but if then they need this intermediary step i think doing that you could then create it. and again it creates real world data sets you need the data of consumers and i know people like stanislav groff and that have tried to accumulate this and it ends up just looking insane but there is these uh, consistencies within them in terms of like people having positive glow experience afterwards the antidepressive uh the uh even analgesic effects of things like dmt like i had a friend with chronic pain who when he smoked dmt for the first time when he came back round was crying partly yes because he enjoyed and loved the experience because it was the first time in his adult life that he'd been pain free yeah, so, so there's, right. there's all of these are the things that we can't wait 10, 15, 20 years. If people no, can go, go on Reddit and find out now, there's, it's, if it's happening somewhere on the world, it can happen. People will find a way to do it. And if we're responsible, we should be reducing the harms and tying that together with the acquisition of obviously anonymized data to understand then are the effects as bad as they are, like in, as Professor Nutt did when he, he reclassified the, the harms of the top 20 drugs. Yeah. It, if we can get that sort of information out there, like you said, that's standardized and it already exists, but as you said, there's this bigotry and ignorance. It was, the British didn't produce it, so therefore it's subpar. Yeah. So I mean, there's people yeah. 20, 30 years ahead of us out there. Like yeah. we need to play catch up, otherwise we're really going to miss out. And if the T T Tigger report, the TTGR report was for anything, it was for these kind of things. And it's like the the tripping over the, the I don't know what the visualization in my head is, but they're trying to carry too much that they're tripping over it. 
Whereas yeah. if they just go and take it little by little, we'd actually get a lot further. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's everything is very sad. I think it comes down to uh, mainly education. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctor, there's still there's. I feel, and I'm always I have to be optimistic in this space, don't we? But my gut feeling is that it's becoming more accepted to the medical profession, but not enough yet. And it's still the few doctors now who think, yeah, this might be something in this, are pushing against a very closed door of approval. We can't do that. The floodgates are open. That's a phrase we hear all the time. Uh, it's going to cost too much, which is not true if you do it in volume, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, take one quick, I, as you probably know, I, I, I came back on the register to prescribe for children because we couldn't, couldn't find a single pediatric neurologist in the country to prescribe, which is, that says something in his own right. Yeah. I was expecting, as an adult neurologist, I was expecting a lot of pushback from the pediatric community for the, the children I prescribed for. And actually, I haven't had any, and not many, um, but some have written to me and said, yeah, thanks for doing this. Um, the, I know the child's better. I can't prescribe it, but you can. So I've actually, limited way, I've got not the negativity I thought I would get. I almost certainly would have got two years ago, three years ago. So... I take that as a good sign that finally um, the benefits of cannabis are beginning to eke into the um, into the system. Yeah, now, I'm fully aware. If you ask me back in five years, I may say exactly the same thing. With uh, there may be a few more patients, and that's all. But I yeah. love to think that uh, I don't believe in that sort of tipping point concept. We got let's say we have got fifty thousand patients now. I have to make up a number, but let's say when we get to hundred thousand two or three years, those 100,000 people will go back to their family and their friends and their GP and their consultant and say, look, you were wrong, it's helping me. And there will come a point when that's so, it says so often, by even if those people just know six others, that's half a million people who are going around saying this is good. Uh, and then eventually the NHS will have to give in. There'll be a few brave doctors who push it on the NHS and then it will begin to roll. I'd like to think that's next year. I've realistically, I think it's within the next three to four. Mm. Oh, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I think the issue isn't the people. The issue is the institutions. Yes, and I think it's something that we see with the way the British politics was structured, the deliberate the fortification of the class system into politics and into neoliberal capitalism. And so I think for all the individuals who go, oh, yeah, I see, I see this, the fear of the board, the fear of the collective power of that governance. And I think it's, yeah, we need more rebels from from the me you medical do. side, yeah. people that are just can actually just look at the data. Yeah. And I think this is why we need, again, more documentaries, more stories, more yeah. things that are compiled together, not that becomes fluff and propaganda for the medical cannabis industrial complex, as in the, the the investor class behind it that are really pumping and dumping this shit on the stock markets around the world and setting up systems to benefit themselves under the guise of, you know, liberating the people. Um, so, yeah, I think, it, 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 as I keep arguing as well, we need synergy between the spaces, the disparate spaces. For all what I do isn't medical first. We promote the medic, uh, medicinal benefits of cannabis, whether you choose to grow it, whether you choose to get a prescription. I'll advocate for people to get prescriptions if they drive a lot or they're in a danger city. You know, there's some hotspot cities in this country that you shouldn't drive with cannabis just because the yeah. the statistics are so skewed that you are proportionally are disproportionately going to be impacted by it. Yeah. Uh, for housing protection, for keeping your kids, job, etc. For those kind of benefits, 100%. Yeah. But if you choose to then get benefit from growing it yourself, 100% go do that. I'll support everybody. Yeah. And I think if we can find a, a more synergy, and I think there are some players in the medical system that want to promote Grow Your Own, but obviously there's at least one big boy in the scene at the minute in Cure Relief that really don't want it. And obviously Cure Relief came in and bought out Sapphire and the Sapphire Foundation. And yeah. you mentioned before of the 40-something clinics. I think I saw earlier, uh, was it Kieran? Is it Kieran? Is it K H E? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm called Chiron. Chiron, that one, and L A something, Lavar, whatever it was. These two clinics have merged, um, and I think it's it's. Oh, it's, there's it's, one. There's a merge between that and um, Zerenia or something as well. I heard a, was, a, Yes, a, yeah. This, this, and I think it's. Yeah, some, I think it's, we're going to see this um, amalgamation of 
Oh, thanks. Mm, it's something an investor mate of mine said, and I know that's a contradiction. Uh, he's a he's a nice guy. He's just happens to be on the other side of the class divide. Um, he was part of a conglomerate that was just basically circulating, ringing the clinics, going, "You bust yet? You bust yet? You bust yet?" So they could buy their infrastructure because the licenses and everything are transferable. And so I think we're we're kind of seeing a thing at the minute where yes, there's more products on the market, but the inconsistency of products for people is massive. Like people are jumping clinics just to try and find the same product. And the clinics are obviously basing this not on cultivar names, because obviously now we're moving to hide cultivar names. Yes. They're doing it based on the ratio of THC to CBD. And you and I know that that can be completely different profiles of plants. It could be something that will knock them for six and absolutely just yawning halfway through their vape and dozy and drowsy or something so uplifting yeah. that their, their heart starts racing, their head starts going, you know, they start overthinking. It's what can be done if anything, to to put that information, like to bring those things together, because some of the clinics are now, or there are databases, things like Medbud and that, that will correlate the terpene profiles, flavonoids, et cetera. And yeah. that's allowing some patients to make that choice. But if this is all about patient choice because of the access, surely we should have that information. It seems to me, Absolutely. it feels like it's for the benefit of those boys going, sell this, what have we got? Buy that. And it's they're shopping around and buying cheap yeah. product from around the world and then just times 10 11 fold the the, yeah. the price of it and they're like you said they're arguing oh well street price is xyz so we'll go for that instead of what the product could really be worth and as a grower yeah. i know 25 quid for an ounce is, is is probably a bit much if you take out your labor once you work on all your costs and you dial it and people can if you scale that up you can dial that down to next to nothing yeah so well, it's really about the i mean as, as, as again as you and i know the minor cannabinoids, the terpenes, even the flavonoids, which you don't hear much about, all have their medical benefit. And what I what I've long advocated for is not focus on the on the single, let's call it strain name, which means something. Of course it does, but it doesn't tell you anything much. Uh, in what you need, I think, and feel free to differ with me, simple, is the is what is the certificate of analysis thing, which sounds too a bit too scientific, but it's actually all all that all that I want to see is that is the chemical composition of that particular product, the, the chemovar, what's in it. And that's what determines its effect. And there's lots of things we don't know enough about. We don't know very little about flavonoids and what they do. Uh, but we need the doctors and the, and, the, and the people prescribed need to know what's in it. And then we can know this particular combination suits you and it helps you sleep, whereas this, this same thing won't help this person to sleep or this, this terpene profile is is really good for sleep in combination with anxiety all those things we will learn all that so i i really think it's it's essential that the, the the people making this stuff tell us exactly what's in it and getting them to boot terpene profiles is very difficult it's getting better they didn't do it because it costs money and they needn't do it it's not compulsory you need to know that there's no heavy metals obviously you need to know there's no microbacterial um, contamination shot sure. And you need to know the headline THC CBD, sure. But you need to know so much more than that. And because you don't have to do that, a lot of people don't do that. And I think that's a great shame. We need those cannabinoid and terpene profiles much more readily available. Mm -hmm. I think also as a as a grower and a long, well, very at this point, very long term consumer, the grow medium impacts as well. And we still are not really sure of what is the standard protocol because there isn't one so it should be like you said almost the guidelines by nice or somebody like that should be okay it should be growing in this medium it should be using with this new it should be following a rough cycle of xyz because there's so much contradictory science so much what's called like bro science or i suppose grow science or bro grow science um and people go, well, this works for me and this works for me. And it is so nuanced, like microclimates, pH of your water, your EC conductivity yeah. of your grow medium. Like there, you well, can really, you shine that's yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So you can really get into this. And I think what you're saying about the batch testing is again, all of this, this is where AI and cannabis should be in synergy for, for business yes. is the, there was a system that I was introduced to maybe about eight years, seven years ago now, and it combined like LIDAR and laser and loads of different stuff. And it was like a crop monitoring system for like fields. Mm. Um, and the evolution of that technology could lead to a point where 
it's registering the profiles of the plants at all times because if, if it's got enough uh, sensors to then read the yeah. different profiles at different times, it then starts to create huge data sets around each cultivar. And if then they're going into the standardization of production of then one mother cut out rather than cutting and then a cutting, then a cutting and, and risking, again, we don't know if genetic drift is real. Some articles and some studies say yes, some say no. But if you have a, a unique batch testing, Obviously, there'll be difference between the lower and the upper of the plant. But if you could use this technology to go, OK, if it's been harvested from the top third, it's on average going to be X, Y, Z. If it's yeah. this, it's going to be this, it's going to be this. And through yeah. that, it's because of cannabis being so different, like one plant might have been just outside of that airflow, but just inside of this one enough that then the light cooled to two degrees extra and this changed this and that. Yeah. Like it's yeah. so new, but the tech could then start to understand those differences and like you said then on the other side of that the ai tools and algorithmic uh learning mach machine learning programs should be used to and again anonymize uh, anonymously correlate the data of, of patients of every other data point that you can come up with because there is going to be something we will find out in the future a long time from now when the bigotry and the wars are all over um of how cannabis affects each endocannabinoid system. I don't believe that it can truly be that we are as unique as snowflakes as it's stated to be. I think there must be something that, okay, we actually now understand that if you take cannabis on an empty stomach, it'll increase this to this percentage or it'll reduce this. If you've eaten this oxidizing product within 48 hours, it'll do this. If you, So we can really start to understand the nuanced effects of yeah. Of, of cannabis because again as a long time consumer I can smoke something that I've grown for years and know its profile and it just suddenly hits me different one day and you're like whoa what was that and you're like ah I'm under I haven't slept really well this, uh, the previous few nights you know I haven't eaten I haven't da -da -da, I'm maybe thirsty that's why I've got extra cotton mouth but like, and you start to understand your yeah. personal interaction with this as you said yeah. this botanical whereas the pharmaceutical is almost the opposite on the spectrum because it's so standardized whereas cannabis is so variable in its nature yeah and I think a lot of the potential prescribers can't get their mind around that. They just don't understand that. It's, it's pseudoscience to them in a lot of ways, but because as you said before, with the pain thing, if they're not aware, they, we, they are aware and some studies do talk about it and, and especially people that work in uh, like end of life, the quality of life is really the thing you start to, to focus on. And I think it almost needs to come to this point of humility. I've described it before as physician supremacy of this idea that doctors are almost taught this, well, I'm 10 years of education. You know, I went to these schools and, and all these other things that kind of fortify their ego and their sense of identity and that, no, well, I'm professional, right about everything else. And then you come to me with this plant and say, it's magic. Like, no, no. do you know what I mean? Uh, I can understand it. Yeah, I think it's, it's sad. I think you to generalize horribly and there's some really good doctors who are open-minded. Of course. And there's, a, there's a load who are frankly arrogant um, and how dare a patient come and try and tell me what to prescribe? Um, and th that is a real issue. And it's sad. It doesn't just apply to cannabis. It applies to a lot of other things. Um, and my view of the medical profession has changed a great deal, I have to say, in the last five or six years since I've been, if you like, on the other side, as it were. I've seen the appalling arrogance, stupidity and prejudice in many, not necessarily individual doctors so much, but their, their representative bodies. You know, like the British Pediatric Neurology Association, I, I do enjoy uh, criticising them at every possible turn. But, you know, they're just, they're, their minds are closed. How dare anyone have asked what to do? Where's the evidence? All this stuff comes out. And that, mm -hmm. that makes me really sad that medics should be excited about something new and excited about this plant, which has so many potential uses. It's not an absolute wonder drug that's going to cure everything known to man. Of course it's not, but it's really exciting. And an open-minded medic and researcher should be really excited about the potential this has. But uh, are they? No, the hell they are. Mm, and that's, yeah. I find that very sad, a very sad reflection on the medical profession and the training of the medical profession as well. Do you think this is almost a problem that solves itself with enough time that as the older generations kind of die off, regardless of institutional education, if all their neighbors are growing weed, smoking weed, if they go to cannabis events like mine, they're, you know, at festivals and people are taking drugs and they may maybe dabble in some things while they're in university. Like, I, I think that that kind of, it's, it's going to close the gap. I just worry about how much damage, further damage is done to society and how many more individuals suffer as a consequence of this ignorance. Yeah. I quite agree. I mean, 
in 20 years, let's be very pessimistic for a moment, yeah, we'll get there. There's no doubt. I mean, the, the global progression is happening. Slow but sure, there's Thailand, there's Germany, you know. Um, now there's uh, well over half of the states, all of Canada, et cetera, et cetera. We know all those figures. And there, yeah, the realisation that it's not an appalling thing and everyone's going to go psychotic in the streets is beginning to filter through to people. And we, it will happen in this country. But I think, sadly, the UK is really, although UK establishments are very conservative, I'm more conservative than most um, countries, I think we'll be certainly the back end of that queue. Mm. I, lo- I would like to think we're not the last in the queue, but, uh, you know, it will happen. It will mm. happen. But uh, it's not fast enough for me and it's not fast enough for you. and It's not fast enough, more particularly for several million people who might benefit. Entirely. I think there's a certain irony in that with people like the uh, Liberal Democrats now saying they want a new economic union with the EU. I think uh, Germany is going to prove, along with Malta, Switzerland, even though they're not part of the EU, but various other nation states as a, on the continent, as it were. Yeah. Um, when the bloc decides to go, they're going to go big. And I think this country, we should be smart and be from the outside looking in and go, all right, you want weed? We'll give you weed. Do you know what I mean? There is you fly on a plane in this country. There is umpteen amounts of land that is just not doing anything in this country. Yeah, we can argue about cyclical farming or whatever, but with government paying for subsidies to not farm, things are pretty fucked. Whereas for cannabis, we could plant it, capture all that CO2 that we've got a problem with, exactly. get rid of you, Les, and yeah. all these other bloody problems. Yeah. Like I said, the NHS could be the primary financial beneficiary of this, plus then getting the best products. We then export that to the, Europe and the rest of the world, and we become a powerhouse rather than a victim to the success that we built. Frankly, it's the UK that really pushed this forward. Yeah, yeah. granted, GW, and what they did, and there's a lot to come out and will be coming out in the future about the uh, supposed and alleged conspiracies and criminality and potential, or well, really immoral actions of certain individuals, but that's for another episode with another day. Um, but I think we could make up for what we did as the British Empire. We took so yeah. much from the world and we could give so much back and we could put so many people yes. that are already growing in this country. We have some talented growers that are also having to be become criminals to survive. They're having to worry about being robbed, so they're carrying weapons. They're having to be worried about cameras and stuff uh, hunting them, so they become antisocial or things like that. So it's a response to prohibition that creates the criminalization within the cannabis space. And I think if we can seek to remove that, there are entrepreneurs, millions of them potentially in this country, of people that want to start cannabis brands, drug brands, that want to you know, give their lived experience for decades an opportunity to transfer their criminal record into a, a CV. And... Exactly. We could, we could yeah. do that. I mean, I'm not but necessarily... The other, the other, I mean, if you just look at it purely economics, I'm sure neither of us want to look at it purely economics, but let's do that for a minute. Um, job curation. You know, we reckoned, uh, extrapolating from some of the experience in the US states, about 100,000 jobs could be created in the UK, proper paying jobs. And I hesitate, I'm not one to push taxes for Christ's sake, but at least those people will be paying taxes. You can, you, can, uh, you know, the tax income very crudely estimated will be at least three or four billion pounds from that industry and if you don't if you don't like cannabis otherwise if you don't think it's you don't believe in medical benefit at least look at the economic benefits of the country and the job benefits for the country and more particularly of course the medical benefits but you know it, it's such an obvious thing to get right and the government isn't really i'm more hopeful about this government than the last one but that's not saying much as yet yeah it's uh it's interesting. I think uh, I'll be joining the Green Party shortly. I voted for them in the, the last election. Watching their conference and seeing their evolution, um, I, th- I think the synergy in terms of their position on drug decriminalization, but also the creation of community-focused uh, industry around these things is, is what really, really interests me because th- that's what I'm in this space for is hopefully that one day the work that I have done with others will mean that the teenage me doesn't have to go through half the shit that I went through. Do you know what I mean? It's just there as an option. If they go, oh, I'm 18, I might try cannabis. They just do. There's no shit they have to worry about. They don't get as I am. I'm still scared of sirens. The siren goes close to me and and shit. Do you know what I mean? The blue light still, it's the fear that you have that is is like inculcated into you when you operate in this space on, well, I suppose this side of it, is, is, is pretty insane when you consider the banality of the plant 
academically yeah, when you exactly. truly break it down and go actually yes in a, in this percentage of people and in that percentage further still this may occur or the probability of that happening dirt but actually that's related to pre-existing conditions there are other genetic factors there are things of we're now starting to slowly figure out that we'll get it there eventually some people can be allergic to cannabis it's just going to be a thing People can have a sensitivity to any damn thing. So they can produce their endo endocannabinoids endogenously and have that production. Obviously, phytocannabinoids mimic this, but then the introduction of them, it's like left-hand, right-hand molecules. There's still something that means the body might yeah, not, not uptake them. not right for everybody. I mean, no, no medicine is ever right for everybody. There's some people who shouldn't take it. Some people react badly to it. But those numbers are actually very, very small. They're there. Of course they're there. They'll always be there. Um, but, you know, it's a remarkably safe medicine basically remarkably mm. safe compared mm. to most other things available and i think with the consequences like we said it should it should the assumption should be the other way around it's fine for everybody until it isn't but then have the infrastructure to go oh crap you've had a okay let's okay you had this this happened here's the procedure to deal with it um and then it's dealt with in just a health reaction in the same way as if somebody had a psychotic episode from drinking too much alcohol People don't suddenly treat them as if they're a bad person. The, the you know the policing infrastructure, the the medical infrastructure. Granted, if they're being violent or whatever, the 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 procedures to deal with that again with restraint, etc. Um, but this is done with the best uh, intentions for the individual possible, or th theoretically, it's done with the best intentions as possible. I think if we had that kind of system of the assumption that yeah, everyone can try and have cannabis, but then if you have the problem, then come to us. The, the money, again, the economics make more sense. Spending it all to stop 66 million people doing it or spending some money to have a couple of hundred thousand people that might have a problem with it. The, exactly. the, the economics and like the, the difference of criminalizing ordinary people mm. and it turns them away from wanting to work with police, wanting to be part of their community. You know, they're fearful. I'm smoking a joint, got to shut the windows, shut the curtains. Do you know what I mean? The scared yeah. of the smell and it's... I just want to see the the healing of the world, as you know, as Bob Marley described it. And I think cannabis is one of the roots to that because it, yeah, it puts us all on that even keel. And I think that's what the, I'm I'm liking. It's taking its time, but I'm liking seeing from a lot of the air quotes, sorry, normie patients that are now getting to dip their toe into cannabis culture and going, oh wow, this is so rich and and unique and yeah. so like uh, historic. Like, and I think the the synergy there will inevitably come, but I do think there are certain vested interests that obviously don't want there to be one big tent with everybody consuming cannabis and, and promoting it. They want us in our little fractured teepees. Yeah, I fear you're right. I fear you're right. Not everyone's in this for the right reasons. Yes, yes. And it's uh, increasingly harder to figure out who and what and where and why. So we just, we plod through, we plod through. <laughs> All right. Um, Let's do a couple of quick quick fires then. Uh, yeah. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, so yeah, I can't remember the statistic. I think it was seventy something percent, but I can't remember who. It might have been in Cannabis Health magazine actually. Uh, a survey of cannabis patients, and the majority suggested that they smoke their prescription. Yeah. Is it time that we had a conversation about pure combustion and cannabis uh, on prescription because? It says under the uh, 2018 amendment to the 2001 misuse of drugs regulations, the literally on the bottom, it's like five words, the smoking of cannabis is prohibited. But other than that, there's no legislation as far as I can see for voiding the uh, prescription. There's no police law by which they can arrest you if you're smoking it. Um, so I'm just wondering. Do so it's, we... it's a very, it's a funny I'm not a lawyer, but it's a very grey area. I mean, I know that your guts would be right. I don't know the figure either, but um, people prescribe for vaping, uh, many do smoke it. Purely from a medical point of view, um, purely from a medical point of view, uh, it's it's more controllable to vape. Um, there's less bioavailable, there's more consistent bioavailability. In other words, a single vape is more consistent vape to vape than smoking to smoking. So medically, vaping is better. The temperature, as you know, is lower. So I don't think there's actually any evidence of the high temperature for smoking releases carcinogens as you do with tobacco. I don't think the evidence is there at all. But even if you even if you don't believe that, um, it's the temperature is much less. Therefore, you get less risk of that, less irritation for those who have uh, respiratory problems. So I can I can see the sense medically of vaping versus smoking, but 
many people prefer it, and I can't see a problem with it. If uh, if if a an individual the smoking seems to be better for them, then why not? It's the same stuff, just in a different format. But you're right. It, it is. It's uh, in the misuse of drugs regulations came out in 2018. It was uh, smoking was not changed its status, so it's still illegal. Um, but it, it's a very grey area. Because I've got a little bit, a little bit conspiracy. If you look at section, I believe it's 8D of the Misuse of Drugs Regulation 1971, uh, specifically says about like licensees and, and uh, people that are like renting a venue or a, like renting a space to somebody to use, that the smoking of cannabis, it literally describes the smoking, not the consumption of cannabis. This is the smoking of cannabis uh, being a, a criminal offense, a chargeable offense, and you can risk losing license. And so that was kind of put in, Oh, seems to have been put in for people smoking weed in pubs. So then they could say, ah, we'll pull your alcohol license unless you stop people smoking cannabis in your beer garden. And I, I just think I can't help but feel that if then you let that go in the medical thing, you could all of a sudden have places where people are smoking cannabis. And then because of under the 2010 Equality Act, it's unlawful to ask uh, a patient about their prescription drug and what they're using it for these two things tied together means we can just have cannabis clubs and where people are behind closed doors, the police are not allowed to get in there and ask. The assumption is that everybody is smoking prescription cannabis, etc. Yeah. Yeah, the, the cannabis clubs is an interesting area. I mean, I, I think it shows how silly the law is at the moment when you've got areas like Durham that have publicly said they're not going to prosecute people for simple possession and other areas next door in Northumberland where they do exactly that. Areas like, as you know, on um, Stockton, where the, um, Michael Fisher's club is, is is not tolerated. Indeed, in a, in inverted commas, supported by the police, who prefer people to go there than get it off the streets and the street gangs. Mm -hmm. So, no law is a sensible law if it's in, interpreted in such hugely different ways across the country. I think there's now six police areas where they openly tolerate, if that's the right word, the cannabis clubs. And other areas that clamped down stupidly. There was a court case I was it did settle out of court last week, um, where the guy was just growing, I think six plants for his own personal use, and he was taking two and a half years to get it to court. I mean, for, that's what a waste of a waste of time and energy and effort. But if he, if he'd done that in Durham as opposed to where it was, then you know it wouldn't have been even prosecuted mm. at all. So the whole the whole thing is a is a frankly a mess and. The government needs to realise it's a mess and get on and sort it out. Hundred percent. I mean, the, the postcode lottery thing is is deeply frustrating. Um, just to kind of update you, Durham have changed its stance in the past kind of few years, not officially on paper, because obviously that would betray the legacy of the late Ron Hogg. Yeah. Um, but their approach, so they've kind of shut doors talking to activist groups, so people from sex work reform, drug law reform, and cannabis reform. Um. Well, We've had, or I've had a few mates that have been raided for personal personal cultivation. Um, they are still putting people through the diversion scheme for simple possession. Um, the diversion schemes are still in place. Um, I think more for financial reasons than moral reasons, as it were. Um, but we are having some good success with the events that we've been putting together in Durham. So we worked with the protest liaison team. And I reached out to them uh, ahead of Durham's 420 event in April. Yeah. And the response I got from them was phenomenal. Blew me away. Yeah. They were like, we trust you. We know exactly like what your events have been in the past and, and everything else. We see no reason. Uh, what is it? No, There is no police procedural reason to, uh, no, there is no operation police operational reason for us to police these events. And they know exactly what we do. And it's based on the same discretion as, as Michael that, People are going to consume cannabis anyway. Would you not rather they buy it from people that you know it's yeah. cannabis? It's not yeah. sprayed with synthetics. It's not got yeah. anything else that it shouldn't have on it. Um, and that's leading us to a position of ex exactly the same thing, that the individuals I'm speaking with in the police are interested in the concept of, well, if you're all in one space, because yeah. I've just pitched it to them, like you can either trip over people in parks all around the county you can find them in car parks you can you know find them in the back house and estates you can just diffuse consumers because they've got nowhere safe to be or you can have a space where you know they're getting you know harm reduction education they're getting the best up-to-date yeah. information and they can socialize they can connect with each other they can 
you know, talk about best practice and best approach and yeah. learn from each other, which I think is is something intrinsically important um, to yeah. this space yeah. is community. And it desperately needs rebuilding in the wake of the law change because it's it's yeah. set brother against brother, sister against sister, as it were. And it's it's all got a bit messy. Um, yeah. yeah. One of my other quick fire questions there was actually yeah. kind of touch on it there was synthetics. Um, is there any conversation, anything like that happening or within research? Because one of the things I realized the other night, I was kind of sat there and it hit me like a brick wall. I was like, oh, shit. The synthetics being allowed to release, ultimately, most of them are patented by somebody somewhere. And it's like they're doing real world trials. So they're getting it out and all these people and all these different markets can consume them and they can figure out, you know, what's happening, where's where's problems. And because of their standardization and because of their difficulty in replication through cultivation, that was a lot of Asians, sorry, um, through cultivation, the, the, that will capture that's its own medical market. If they could then bring that in as a medical mark model and it's like a HHC with a, a different carbon molecule on it and it's like, well, nobody else can produce that and only it could only be synthesized, but they can't synthesize it because they can't get the license. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... I'm not aware of a lot of work on the synthetics. I mean, it started, then people began to realise, I forgot the name of the guy in the States who started doing the work on it. Um, but anyway, I think they began to realise, it's, it's interesting theoretically, because you can you can look and theoretical about the academic interaction of those synthetics with the endocannabinoid system. They're much purer. Hmm. So it's of theoretical and academic interest in practical terms, as you know, I, I, they're the more dangerous far more dangerous, a lot more side effects. And of course you miss out what I'm a great believer in is the, the subtlety of the plant. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the entourage effect is perhaps a bit of an overworked term, but I think we both know that the, minor, the other minor cannabinoids and the terpenes that we said earlier make a real contribution. If you try and pharmaceuticalize it, um, and a, if that's a dreadful word, but I'll keep using it. If you find food like, because it's much easier, isn't it? People will say, "Oh, it's much easier to have one single model. You know what you can do. You can compare it to placebo." They're trying to farm. They're trying to make it a pharmaceutical product. They're pushing it down that route, and it is not a pharmaceutical product. No matter times I've said that, um, it's a botanical product, and you you miss the subtlety. So actually, I I don't support um, the development of the the medicine from synthetics. Because I don't think they're going to, they're not going to work as well if you compare it dialects, even at a simple level, uh, which isn't a, a which isn't synthetic, um, but it's a, it nearly pure CBD. You compare its effect on epilepsy to the proper plant, and it doesn't work as well, and it's got more side effects. And you take that further along the line in the synthetics, they're not going to work as well, and they've got even more side effects. Why bother? You've got a plant that's really good. Use the plant. Okay, use synthetics for an academic progression of our scientific knowledge, fine, but not as a medicine. No, agreed. It's it's interesting because it's I do fear that on paper, those same institutions and kind of what we've alluded to through this conversation of the certain academics may look at that and go, okay, I will take a lower eff efficacy for a higher consistency. And if they're then discounting these pseudoscience, well, that's not the data. I've been trained that here are the six data points you have to deal with. Yeah. Anything else outside of that is an anomaly, a variable, is something to be calculated away. And I think it's just, like I said, it's at that time, it's just a race of this new generation, and that could have be of all ages. I just mean in terms of like a new wave, a new movement. And then there is this, this snail slogging along of those systems going and they're slowly bringing bits in and putting it together. And I think for all, we've got a lot more obstacles and roadblocks to come over. I think if people that are weed, people that are drugs, people that are just kind of more open-minded, whatever side of the line you fall on, if we can all start to have more of these conversations and congregate and gather on mass in forums and, and through media to kind of standardize our approach, not that we're all, oh, we've got to sing from the same hymn sheet, but to recognize that there is this opposite thing that's doing it. And sometimes, in fact, quite often, a lot of what we do just empowers that, puts another roadblock in front of us and then gives them more stuff for them to fortify their defense against us. And I don't know, I, I've been, I, I released the calendar for next year for my events and I wanted to actually okay. ask you this because two of the other academics I said this to, one of them gave me a bit of a, oh, you shouldn't do that. And the other was like, probably going to cause problems. I wanted to do a farmer, PH farmer versus farmer, F-A-R-M farmer. 
Yeah. Um, and it not verses in like a battle. I was just like the, the language that fell together yeah. in my head, but it would be a, a panel, a day long series of panels and talks with representatives from kind of all sides to discuss the synergies. There's the things that are the same. Yeah. We can talk about the little bits that we create or oh, the language and linguistics means that it's different. No, it's the same damn thing. But if we get promote that and show that, okay, I've got 30 years doing this in the field or right, I've got 20, yeah. 30 years doing this in the lab. Yeah. I think there needs to be these kind of more synergistic events, but I fear yeah. that the majority of the money, uh, no offense, cannabis in Europa, um, but a lot of the money where that ends up going and the events that they create are exclusive by their nature. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And so the, the more that they can grow and progress in that way, the less people partake in it. And it's like, what's going to happen with AI feeding AI and eating AI until eventually everything becomes gibberish. And I think that's where they're going is they're starting a circle round. And some of them, again, will be like we were saying before, people that are of interest, that are really curious to see what this could do to help others to change yeah. the world and to yeah. make a better society. There's too much ass on them at the moment. Anything you can do uh, to, to put together in the same panel, the PH farmers against the F farmers, um, there's a title in there somewhere, isn't there? Um, would be great. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people who do, who aren't so antagonistic to each other, but they're they're kept down by their their own prejudice or the prejudice of their peer groups around them. You know, a pharmaceutical guy. Go, I'm going to go on a panel to talk about cannabis with people who've been growing it for years. We'll probably get a lot of lot of shit from his some of his colleagues, so they don't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the more we can do that, the more we can break down those sometimes really artificial barriers between the different approaches, the better. So. Yeah, go for that. Okay, well, look to do yeah, something. Yeah, you know, similar to what we kind of did in Bourbon Hall, Hall, but a bit, bit more of a larger scale, um, and do a live stream, etc., and have audience questions. I think uh, I, I want to put something together like that that is purely yeah. educational, and it's not. It's it's the opposite of confrontational. It's true discourse. It's yeah. not as actually like bearing down on each other and oh, you're this, you're that. It's here's what I found. Here's what I found. All right, let's put it together and see what it is. A sensible and dare I say it's an old fashioned word, but polite debate because there's so much um, on Twitter. I think I, I hate that medium, but everyone's so angry on it. Let's have a little less anger and a little more cooperation. 100%. 100%. There is great synergy there to be found. Yeah. Um, do, do, do. Interesting one. Uh, last October, the uh, FSA reduced the CBD daily limit to 10 milligrams. Yes. Yes. Thoughts on that? Because to me, it seems absurd. It's a complete and utter bollocks. It's <laughs> a good answer. <laughs> there was absolutely no shred of evidence that backs up that statement. After all, their own, they originally said 70 milligrams mm -hmm. on no evidence. There was absolutely no evidence. They reduced 70 to 10. And that is not compatible with the world's view on it. Like Australia, I think it's 150. I might be staying corrected. But you know, people have put sensible limits on. I don't think there is much of a sensible limit, but maybe I can understand why a limit needs to be put on it if it's an over-the-counter product, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but 10, absolutely no sense, no science and no reply to asking the question to the FSA, please show us your evidence. They said, no, we can't, we don't know it. Um, you don't know the evidence. You can't show us the evidence, mate, because there isn't any evidence. Mm. The only thing I can guess that they've got, there are studies using very high doses in rats that showed some liver damage, but that was about a thousand times, literally a thousand times what you'd use in man. Mm. And you've got the ridiculous thing, over the count of 10 milligrams, I prescribe for children up to a, a thousand milligrams or so for children from a licensed product. I don't actually use Epitalex much, but there's a licensed product, goes through all the hoops that it required, and you could up to 2000 milligrams for children. Mm. But um, somebody in the street taking it to help with sleep or with a bit of pain or discomfort, no more than 10. I mean, where is that coming from? Why is that there? Why did they do it? Mm. That would effectively. It didn't destroy the industry. That will be over an overstatement, but it's it's had a really negative effect on the CBD industry and many of the smaller CBD companies are around out of business. So yeah. it's a very negative effect uh, on no basis whatsoever. I'm surprised there's not more fuss about it in the media, to be honest. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think it's 
you know uh the convergence of interests of stakeholders is probably why uh you know boys going to the same school and then getting in different departments and going oh dave you all right we're gonna run this story for us all right you're gonna bury that story for us all right um yeah it's, it's interesting to me if i were to put my tinfoil hat on or if i think back to my conversations with kevin jones it very much feels like a way to make cbd only a medical product yeah so that it's then a novelty you can have your 10 milligrams or your 10 this because it then means the size of the bottles that the people will be producing etc Pe people have to take a whole product effectively to get a therapeutic effect so then they're going to try this thing and go oh it's not it's not helping so like as you said that that takes that market out of the way while then allowing for all of the patents and the research and the extraction patents etc uh for creating all of these medical cbd products um that infrastructure then is ramping up so it, it does feel like a yeah you know, like a co-option a capture of another sector of the market yeah uh, it's it's beyond me and they were unapologetic about it refused to reveal evidence though and they based it upon and uh, it's a mystery and it's it's very sad and um, 10 milligrams is it suits some people but the, most people need a lot more than that to have any medical effect and the average is 60 80 to 100 milligrams for anxiety and such like and that's a perfectly safe uh, dose for the vast vast majority of people why put it at 10 i mean yeah. That's the problem with that is a lot of people will believe the label. Oh, the Food Standards Agency has said 10 milligrams. I've tried 10 milligrams. It didn't do anything for me. So then go and buy it. If you'd tried twice as much or 10 times as much, it might have done something for you. Uh, but they've stopped that. Um, I yeah. don't know why they did that. It's beyond me. There must be some. I'm not a great believer in conspiracy theories, but there must be some, must be some shenanigans going on somewhere to come up with such a ridiculous number. Yes, I uh, I do believe so. I think it's part of the illusion of something that they got worried about, that they, a problem they created for themselves was the idea of a so-called, air quotes, recreational CBD market that we were starting to see with people dabbing CBD and wanting to get like CBD pens and CBD this and CBD that. And I think they kind of got fearful that that's a precursor to then, what if it's then THC tomorrow? And there is this just unbelievable gatekeeping and yeah, this more for moralizing of the government and members of these these uh the civil service and these institutions that are just like, well, no, no, it's that's not in my life, so I, I disagree with it. But to me, it it feels like some of those people will get a benefit, but it's because I see cannabis as a vitamin. We're all running around with scurvy, and you add a little orange square, and you went, oh, I feel all right, you know. So you get that little bit, and then you go back and you just have a little bit each day. But over time, your body gets used to it and drops down, and again, you fall back into deficiency. So then you need to get more and more. But if you can't buy more, we go with oranges don't work. And it feels like, the, again, the, the system came along and went, medical oranges, why? Like, it's just this this mental thing that, it, it yeah, it's, it's closer to a food and to a nutrient and a base mineral or, or vitamin that's a requisite for good health than it is a drug in that sense. And it can be taken with not in a non-psychoactive form. You know, if you eat the, yeah. the acidic forms of these things, you're not carboxylating it. So you're not going to get the, the the same high from it, yet you'll get the same proliferal benefits. And that education is not there. That awareness is not there because it feels like they're trying to turn cannabis into the next fentanyl. Do you know what I mean? It, like it's just this thing of we control it, we are the thing, and it's it then becomes, it feels so bastardized. And this is my fear of the synthetics that we went from smoking opium 150 years ago, relatively benign in the grand sense of things here, folks, to then, oh, what have you just created? Uh, we created a heroin. All right, cool. What's that? It's like 10, 15 times stronger. All right, cool. And then some guys come along and go, what have you created? Oh, we created, you know, fentanyl. What's that? It's like 100 times stronger. Oh, okay, cool. Some guys come along, oh, we got car fentanyl. And then for some reason, they all went, let's go back into the 50s. What's this? Nitazines? Like, what the fuck are we doing? They're, they're looking at nitazines now as, as a genuine thing because they've caused lockout of everybody's uh, receptors for opioids. And yet we've got that little plant, like you said, of cannabis that can maybe then lower the pain, but then they can understand it. Whereas if you just take opium because you uh, opioids because you've got a pain in your foot and nobody asks any questions and you just keep taking it. Do you know what it might happen if you smoked weed one time? You might look in your fucking shoe and find there's a little prick or something going in there. Like cannabis, it gives you that introspection and metacognition. You can look at your life and go, actually, why am I in pain? Why is my life sucking? Oh, I'm three stone overweight. Maybe I'll motivate myself to do better. Cannabis, guess what? It'll speed up your metabolism and help with that. 
find the right cultivars and you won't get the so-called munchies. Mm. It's I think it, it can be a holistic medicine, not just for like I'm prescribed it for de depression, but it helps in a myriad of other ways. But I'm not going to go and knock it and go to the clinic and go, oh, can you can you prescribe it to me? Because sometimes it makes me feel euphoric when I wake up and I'm just sad for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a lot of problems still. Yeah, but as you say, yeah, we are getting there slowly but surely. But I say it's a it's a personal battle between getting there properly and um, me actually fading into obscurity. Well, I hope that there is enough of a victory that you get some retirement, Mike. You've, you've served quite well on the front line here, brother. Um, yeah, it's it's an ongoing war. It's an intergenerational war as well. I know that the, the victory I want to see probably isn't going to be in my lifetime. But I know if I don't do the work in my lifetime, yeah. it'll never happen. It'll it never could happen. never happen. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Keep going, Simba. Likewise, likewise. Yeah. All right. I've enjoyed this. Uh, where can people keep up uh, today? Where, like, what should people check out in terms of medical cannabis clinic, society, uh, CIC, etc.? Um, you've got the, the other thing we haven't discussed because we could discuss endlessly is the lack of uh, ability to advertise much. Um, and I, so it's difficult to know, difficult for people to know which which clinic is better for this condition, which is better for pain relief, etc., etc., because the clinics are very limited in what they can do and say. All I can suggest with that is um, if what the clinic is to Google clinics to start with and then do a lot of research online, look at the clinics, look who's there, look which are the doctors in that clinic, are they pain specialists, are they anxiety specialists, then you can hopefully pick a, a, the right specialist. Some clinics are more generic, uh, others are quite detailed in terms of just, just pain, but there's no central repository of this clinic's better than that clinic and this clinic's got this doctor. And that. There's nothing like that, sadly. Um, well, there should be. There should be. There should be a sort of good pharmacy guide as well, because as we know, there are some pharmacies that are, let's put it delicately, are not that efficient. And there are others that are really good. Mm -hmm. um, so um, where can you get information? If you want general information on, on medical cannabis, just to read about it and read a little bit about it. There's not very little um, sort of um, basic guides. It's, again, it comes back to the internet. There's one, I, I haven't come in here to promote it, but there's a, a maple tree. I, I, we uh, produced a, a thing called Introduction to Medical Cannabis. And if you've seen it, you probably won't know because you, you could have written it. Um, uh, but that's I, I'd like I'd like to think that it's uh, it gives a sort of background to the whole thing. If you uh, is, is medical cannabis right for me or not right for me, and what's it about? Does it have a sort of scientific background to it? That's a that's a easily readable book for about thirty a booklet for about thirty pages, mm -hmm. Maple Tree website. But uh, so I, I don't want to promote that stuff. But uh, there's not much not much to promote actually. Mm. Um, the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society, it, obviously it's a society by clinicians for clinicians, but they produce quite an interesting range of books that are free um, to how to prescribe it, what's the questions about CBD. So their, their website's also worth um, looking at. And the CIC produced some, but the latest one was um, a booklet on employers, I don't know, um, housing, wasn't it, I think? Mm. Um, what are the what are the rights you've got if you if you if you're using cannabis in in your in a flat or a leasehold or whatever? So those three organisations and and of course there are others. Um, look at their websites. You get quite a lot of um, interesting, reasonably well written literature. Most of which is most of which is free. Um, nice. And you know the other sites to go to. Ralph's uh, Medbud Wiki, I think, is a. Uh, interesting site with, with gives you all the range of products there it also lists the clinics and the pharmacists and everything it does they do a great i think he does a great job in um don't know where he gets his information from some of the time but he does a great job of putting it out there hmm. yeah no agreed uh, i think good resources and i think for anyone that feels themselves to identify only as a wreck head as it were i say that uh lovingly uh do check out some of these resources because it's it's always good to see um, kind of where and how the space is growing in the different uh, corners yeah, and sex sectors. So, yeah. so do check it out. I'll include all links below. Um, yeah, been a pleasure as always, Mike. I will let you get off uh, to the rest of your day and we shall, uh, yeah, we'll speak next, next year, but definitely sooner than last time 
as in the gap. Okay, we'll have to have an annual update. Then. But thank you for asking me. It's always a pleasure to, to chat through. Um, yeah, thanks again. See you in a year, if not sooner. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I'll catch you beforehand. Uh, hopefully, yeah. like I said, I'll, I'll be in touch about this event that I'm looking to put together. Yeah, thank you for that. It'll be interesting. Be good. Great. Thank you very much. No worries. All right. Take it easy, Mike. Peace and love. Cheers. Bye. 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 Well, there you go, folks. That was uh, Professor Mike Barnes. Uh, yeah, bit of a quick catch-up, bit of a quick recording today. Uh, I've got so much to do uh, at the minute on other projects. I'm just about to go back down to Hemp Garden uh, to do another three, four hours uh, ahead of the event tomorrow, so everything's set up and tidy. Uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you found it interesting. Um, there's quite a bit on my notes here that I didn't get through that I kind of wanted to. Um Maybe I'll get Mike back sooner rather than later because uh, there's some of these things. I think we could almost make an episode out of just a few of these conversations. So I might make something a bit more bespoke uh, and put an episode together into the winter. Uh, I'll definitely have a lot more time to be back to weekly uh, episodes, more record, uh, recording and back to creating clips and shorts, etc. cetera, uh, once the summer's over and things calm down with the DCCC. But yeah, been a pleasure, been a privilege. Uh, check out the links below. And yeah, be good to each other. I'm going to go do some more gardening. <laughs> All right, uh, take it easy. Uh, if you really enjoyed this, please do give us a like, a share, a subscribe, a thumbs up, a heart, a rating, whatever it is you do on your platform to show your appreciation. I appreciate it and I appreciate you for it. Um, yeah, check out superlife.com for articles, blogs, etc. Check out legacyculture.co.uk for more diverse and interesting um, blogs and articles as well. Uh, yeah, I think it's about everything. Patreon, Patreon, go to Patreon. Uh, if you really, really, really enjoyed this, check us out on patreon.com forward slash simplelife.com uh, where for less than a cup of coffee a week, you can help me keep the lights on on this little project of mine. All right, I'm out of here. I'm going to go garden, uh, be good to each other. We'll be back next week with and somebody. Be awesome. You'll love it. I'll love it. All right, peace and love, folks.